Uh, case one, 80 year old man with a slowly growing firm white scar like plaque on the scalp. There is kind of a vaguely neural kind of look to this um, this proliferation. It's a little bit of gently wavy. There are cells, and it, this uh, this scan, I, well, I guess it might be a 40X scan, I can't remember. But it, if you look around, there are some scattered hyperchromatic pleomorphic cells. But I mean, it doesn't really, it doesn't stand out as, you know, obviously malignant at first glance, unless you know what it is. Once you recognize the pattern, when I put this down, this slide down at 2X, this looks like cancer to me. But it's a very, very tricky tumor, and that's why I'm showing it to you today. So this is desmoplastic melanoma, all right? Desmoplastic melanoma is very treacherous because it doesn't look particularly like any other form of melanoma. And in fact, it doesn't always look obviously malignant. It can look like scar. It can look like neurofibroma or other bland spindle cell tumors. The key to me, one thing you can do to cheat a little bit, it's not really cheating. Sorry, if the board ever watches this, I hope they know. But on a test, you can use context clues to recognize that probably, look at this thing. Someone took a huge piece out of this gentleman's scalp all the way down to this structure here. What's this pink band along the bottom under the subcutis? Well, this is fascia, right? And in the scalp, it's, it's basically galea aponeurotica or periosteum, which all kind of come very close together there right over the surface of the scalp. So they've gone all the way down almost to bone, which is common when you're excising a large cancer on the scalp. This is the way it comes out. But the point is, is someone probably biopsied this in the past and called it cancer to get a, an excision of this size on someone's scalp. So if you see a big, huge slab of tissue, you can be pretty sure, oh, this is probably gonna be cancer or, or else it was maybe misdiagnosed as cancer. That doesn't always hold true, but it's a good trick for tests. Um, if you see something that looks like a cancer surgery specimen, then probably it's gonna be malignant. So it's a little bit of a, of a context clue you can use. Here's what helps me though. There's a process here arising from the dermis. It's fibroblastic looking, kind of fibrotic. It's got pink collagen but it doesn't stop at the dermis. Instead, it blows away the subcutis. Look, all this used to be subcutis here, and it pushes all the way through it, all the way down to fascia, and then it starts spreading out laterally. So if you imagine the other side here, this is kind of a, almost an, could have an hourglass kind of appearance. And I feel that's really characteristic. Desmoplastic melanomas often do that. They go all the way down to the fascia or the periosteum. Okay, we'll come, that piece is not as good as this one. The, over here though, the other thing is when I see a spindle cell kind of scar-like or fibroblastic or neural looking lesion in an old, and these are usually in older sun damaged people on the head and neck, the vast majority of desmoplastic melanomas are gonna be on the head and neck of old sun damaged people. The other place you occasionally see them is on acral sites underneath an acral melanoma. They can occur on the trunk or the extremities else, elsewhere, but very, very uncommon they um they um usually are on the head and neck of older people that are sun damaged so the these these clusters of lymphocytes here these are dr rapini one of my favorite derm path mentors said you know lymphocytes are like smart bombs they can see the antigens that we can't see they know these cells are bad now obviously lymphocytes uh come to other things that are benign too but when i see something that looks kind of scar like or neural and i see clusters of lymphocytes lymphocyte aggregates right away i start thinking desmoplastic melanoma Okay, and the key feature then, what you're gonna look for then is look at the cells and what you'll find are spindled cells that look kind of either Schwann cell-like or fibroblast-like with scattered hyperchromatic pleomorphism. See, these aren't super ugly, but they're kind of a bit darker and uglier than a usual fibroblast or say a Schwann cell would be. And you sometimes have to look around for a while to find like big, like obviously atypical cells. Also, if you're lucky, you'll get mitoses. Here's a mite right here. It's a little harder to see sometimes on virtual slides, um, the mitoses, but uh, there, look at that hyperchromasia there. So when I see this, it looks like a scar or a fibroma, scattered atypia, and in between each of the cells, there's a lot of collagen and also some blue kind of mixoid material. So it gives it this kind of slightly pale pinkish blue look because of all of the background collagen in between each of the tumor cells. That's real important for true desmoplastic melanoma. The individual tumor cells should be divided from each other. M most of them should be divided by, from each other by background um, collagen and or mixoid uh, stroma, okay? And again, there's there's uh, pleomorphism. Occasionally they'll kind of clump together like they're trying to make little tiny spindly nests. 
And then the other thing you can look for is this perineural invasion because desmoplastic melanomas love to invade nerves and sometimes they do it so dramatically you can call it a neurotropic form of desmoplastic melanoma where they can completely overrun and kind of fill up whole nerves and so this is a the reason i show this case is i never made like a full length desmoplastic melanoma video so this is going to be it i wanted to start with this one because it's a really important topic it's it's a, a rare subtype of melanoma only like maybe a couple percent of melanomas are desmoplastic and it's really treacherous because it's so easy to miss and think that it's scar or that it's neurofibroma. I've had people send me a message and say, I've got this weird neurofibroma on an old person's scalp and there's, you know, there's all these lymphocytes here. And I'm like, you're describing a desmoplastic melanoma. And then the, they sent it for consult and sure enough, that's what it was. So I always have a low threshold, especially on a shave. If I think something looks like scar, but there's some atypia or there's some lymphocytes, it's an old sun damaged person. They don't have a good reason to have a scar there. Do and S100 or a SOX10, okay? Those are the stains that are gonna stain desmoplastic melanoma. A desmoplastic melanoma is gonna almost always be completely negative for HMB, 45, MART1, melanA, whichever name you like for that, and other melanocyte markers. The only stains that are really gonna reliably stain with, and there's some other esoteric ones people have used, but the, the workhorse stains that I use is SOX, SOX10 and S100, and um, they're gonna stain many of the spindle cells that you're gonna see here and uh, that the problem is is that a neural thing would stain just the same way so telling apart a neural tumor uh, from a desmoplastic melanoma can occasionally be one of the most challenging differential diagnoses because you're between something totally benign and something really malignant and so um, in those cases getting help getting a consult can be helpful there have been occasional times i've had to tell the treating doctors on a small biopsy i'm not sure if this is a neurofibroma or part of a desmoplastic melanoma you need to excise it and no one's super happy with me when i've had to do that and i try to everything i can to avoid it there are some other tricks some people use like cd34 tends to have a very swirly whirly pattern in neurofibromas neurofibromas are usually cd34 positive and it tends to not have that pattern in desmoplastic melanoma but i found that uh, difficult for me to totally rely on uh, you know in a really hard case i'm still not always um, convinced that i can definitively decide once i've got a big specimen like this it usually becomes very obvious see the hyperchromasia there now the other thing you could look for is is there melanoma in situ over top but the problem is is desmoplastic melanoma is about half the time depending on which study you look at um, it seems like the ones that get sent to soft tissue pathologists usually don't have in situ the ones that get sent to derm pats often do if you're looking at consult based studies so um because people often think these are something neural uh, because they'll be S100 positive and, and um, they'll think, oh, it's a malignant peripheral nerve sheath tumor. Uh -uh. MPNST almost never occurs in the skin, and it's usually going to be negative or very weak positive for S100 and SOX10. I've got a whole video about MPNST, but if you think that something is an MPNST in the scalp of an old person, I, I assure you, I will bet you a thousand bucks you're going to be wrong on that. Now, someone one day is going to watch this video and come looking for that thousand bucks. So I'll just say not really, but but I would probably put money on it because it's I, it's going to not be an MPNST. Okay, so that's Desmo. And the problem is, is that these don't often look like melanoma clinically. They often look kind of white scar like plaques, kind of slower growing. So clinically, they don't look that worrisome. Microscopically, they don't. So it's like a perfect storm of false clinicopathologic correlation. And so oftentimes when these are first diagnosed, they're all the way down to fashion. Like they'll be like 14, 15 millimeters thick, very classic. So when you have a, a pure desmoplastic melanoma, which means 90% of the melanoma looks like this, spindle cells with hyperchromasia divided by collagen, when 90% or more of the lesions like that, we call it pure desmoplastic. Plenty of times though, you'll have a mixed uh, desmoplastic melanoma that exists with regular kind of epithelioid melanoma cells or uh, more cellular spindle cell melanoma or some other type of melanoma. Um, those mixed types tend to behave like regular melanomas, more or less. When you have a pure desmoplastic, they're a little unusual. They have a better overall survival on a same depth basis than other forms of melanoma. They tend to be more of a local aggressive problem than distant mets. I can't remember actually ever seeing a distant metastasis from a pure desmoplastic melanoma. I'm sure it happens, but I've seen a ton of melanomas, thousands of them, and I don't think I've ever seen one that I can recall. Also, pure desmoplastics usually do not metastasize the lymph nodes. They have a much lower chance of doing that. So it's an important thing to know. I've seen one of these grow through the skull and into the dura mater and not have metastases and the patient was still alive. I mean, that case, I remember long ago seeing that and it really made me realize these are totally a different sort of tumor than other types of melanoma. 
So Klaus Busam from Memorial Sloan Kettering has done like some of the groundbreaking landmark work on this uh, tumor type and has written a lot of great papers about it. I'll try to link to some of those in the video description. Highly recommend you read those if you really want to understand this disease. But I think this is a very, very classic example of pure desmoplastic and it's one that lacked a melanoma in situ component, which makes it much more uh, challenging. And here's the other piece, which is a little bit more cellular, but even here, the individual cells are divided by background stroma, right? By background collagen. And again, look at the sprinkling of lymphocytes here and see these are getting more hyperchromatic, more atypical. So if in doubt, S100 or SOX10 are your best friends. But look at that waviness. Look, it looks a little wavy, like kind of like neural sort of wavy. I don't really love the word wavy for neural because I don't think neural things are truly, really wavy, but this kind of gently undulating. Oh yeah, that could look neural. It's very, very treacherous diagnosis. And hopefully this video will help other people to recognize it. Desmoplastic melanoma, this one being a pure type. Let me show you just a brief example of the immunostain. Here's another example of shave biopsy. Ooh, this one's a treacherous lesion. Look at that. I mean, there are scattered hyperchromatic cells, but otherwise you might really struggle to wonder what this is, but look at low power. Lymphocyte aggregates, the smart bombs are there. And we've got this kind of mixoid and fibrotic background and hyperchromatic spindle cells scattered in the middle of it. And in this one, we're lucky because we got melanoma in situ component over the top kind of nested almost a little bit nevoid looking, but the whole thing is melanoma in this case. So let me show you, this is a, a desmoplastic melanoma that is pure, but also had an in situ component. You don't count the in situ for pure versus mixed. And then here's an example of what it looked like on S100 stain. S100 stains the in situ component. And also you can see all the dermis is filled with desmoplastic melanoma going all the way to the base. Like I said, these are often 10 millimeters or more at the time of diagnosis. They often really uh, don't, don't show up clinically until they're pretty uh, late. And then here's a, to contrast, here's an example of MART1, which you can see is positive in the in situ component and in a few scattered cells, maybe right underneath in the papillary dermis, and then completely lost, gone. Okay, that is the typical, typical pattern that you would see in a pure desmoplastic melanoma. They're almost always completely negative for MART1 and HMB45 unless they've got an in situ area up top.